thanks, John, for coming on. Uh, this is live in Langley, BC. This podcast is basically covering anything and everything Langley, mostly businesses, because I, I always want to support local, right? And, and you're in a business too that has to do with marketing. So it goes hand in hand what we're trying to accomplish together. So I really wanted to have you on as one of the first guests. So I'm happy that you're on and you're taking the time, uh, you know, from your busy business, uh, ultra digital printing in Langley. And we're going to hear all about that today. So I'm excited to, you know, share that with you guys. Um, but yeah, before we get into all of that, you know, we want to kind of peel back the layers and figure out like what ended up leading you to be in the print business of all places, right? Yeah. Um, like what's your background and who explain to anybody who doesn't know you who John is? Uh, my earliest so my parents were um, worked in print when I was a little little kid mm -hmm. um, and my mom did uh, graphic layout artwork back in the old days where you use letter set and you would scratch out letters and create titles and then cut those out and paste them where you wanted them in the layout and then you would take pictures of that and then um, my dad was a press operator and he would actually make the plates and run the presses that would uh, do that stuff and it was for a, a large organization in um, back in the 1970s uh, uh, before photocopiers were actually mm -hmm. you know a, a real thing uh, if you had a big organization and a lot of things to to print then you would have your own uh, print shop division. So he worked in that sort of uh, a scenario. And then um, the, uh, so as a little kid, I would wander around the shop and play with them and do whatever. So I, I have an, an understanding of how uh, the print industry works from that kind of an old days. Uh, and then my career, it went through a whole bunch of different um, places where I basically I taught myself different aspects of business working in different uh, things. I, I, at one point I worked in credit and collections and, uh, and with accounting. And at another point I, I learned, uh, I worked in several different businesses as a salesperson, uh, really learning how to do sales. I worked as a operations manager for another company, uh, and learned, uh, uh, you know, sort of the operation side of business. And, um, so once I had kind of done all of that and I really felt like I knew what I was doing, I went and started my own business, uh, in when I lived in Abbotsford and, uh, the, uh, I did a whole bunch of technical things that were all web related. And um, the, uh, when I came out of that, I, I had a great understanding of uh, all the graphic design tools and a good understanding of print. And um, so at some point when I had the opportunity to, to jump in and buy this business, I kind of knew the different pieces and I just needed to jump in and put it all together. That's awesome. Yeah, it actually, you know, looking back, you probably can see all the dots and you can connect them all and how it led you to where you are now. Yeah. But at the time you were probably like, where am I even going with all this? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel like I feel like I started off my adult life not really knowing what my future was going to hold, just taking the every day and trying to make the best of decisions that I had with what was available for me. And I didn't really have like a, a life plan or a goal. I was just reacting to the opportunities that came up in a, in a big way. Uh, so, yeah, you look back and you say, oh, I see how I got here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it reminds me actually of what I went through too, like growing up and just bouncing around from s different industries that were totally unrelated. There was some connection, but like it wasn't in the same industry, right? It yeah. went from like cell phone, uh, telesales, door to door, to like selling cars, to like selling social media, agency packages, and then to real estate. So, you know, all the way through it, they were all stepping stones though, looking back, because I took little pieces of information from every, you know, industry I was in and I was able to implement it now in, in real estate. And that's why I feel like I have such a well-rounded understanding that a lot of people who are very linear and they were only ever, you know, in real estate or they were ever only in one business, they only know that business, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it definitely comes in and helps you. Um, so you're based out of Langley. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you said you bought that business. How long ago did you buy that business? I bought it in uh, July of 2019. Mm -hmm. So that gave me about six months to get my feet wet before the world shut down with COVID. Uh, and I, I was just learning the business. And then I had a crash course on how to save the business, <laughs> going through some rather tumultuous times. And, and uh, fortunately, with the background in technical skills, I was able to quickly turn our business into something that could be uh, about 80% of it could be run remotely with graphic designers working from home. Uh, and then I just ran around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to uh, keep machines running and, and whatnot as they were sending jobs in remotely. Uh, it was not optimal, uh, but but it we kept going. Wow, so you were actually like in the shop while everyone's at home sending you all the work. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, I practically lived there. I mean, you have to you have to do what you got to do. Got to right? do what you got to do. Yeah. And then so like, did, did, would you say because a lot of people had the same experience, they had to adapt in COVID. Would you say that moving forward, 
like all those different pieces that you learned through COVID, you could apply them now and now it's helped your business grow and be a little bit more hands off or what would you say? I would, I would say that, um, maybe even the opposite that uh, going through COVID, I learned how to run every piece of equipment. I learned how to fix everything. I learned how to do everything. And, um, there's a, there's a thought that the more that you know how to do in the business, the more you can manage the people that are doing it. And it's actually, it's not true. The, the more that you are personally involved in every single aspect of the business, the more that the business consumes you and people look to you as the decision maker on every single one of these things. So for the first, uh, so the first six months I was jumping in and learning the business, the next year was surviving COVID. I came out of that. And as the business started to grow coming out of COVID and we got busier and busier, the business started to actually just consume my life. Uh, Um, where I was spending 12 hours, 14 hours a day trying to stay on top of things. My inbox was growing and I couldn't stay on top. And um, I needed to actually switch gears. Um, I'll refer to a book called uh, E-Myth, where uh, it it just talks about how to systematize your business and what the trap of being a technician in a business rather than an entrepreneur. And that entrepreneur skill set is learning how to properly delegate how to properly give people job descriptions and and parameters that they can work inside of so they know what they're supposed to be doing and you can begin to work yourself out of a job and so i've spent the last year really focusing on that um so so covid kind of covid kind of pushed me in a direction where i i knew how to run everything uh my time was totally consumed by by answering every purchasing question fixing every piece of equipment dealing with everything and now i'm coming out of it now with um I, i got people that are doing that so now that you understand uh, every component of the business, you were able to delegate uh, different people to their tasks and you know exactly who needed to do what in a sense, right? Rather than like totally, like sometimes you see businesses, um, they come in uh, totally expecting a turnkey business. They don't want to understand anything and they just want to buy the business and hopefully everything that's operating the way that it is continues that way and they have to, they can just walk away and take that, take in that passive income. Um. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, there are people that want that, and those that's actually available. I mean, they call that franchising. You know, you buy a business system that works. Um, the E-Myth stuff that I referred to uh, was a book written in the late 70s, um, and it's uh, it's been revised a couple times, but the, the premise still stands stands true in that if you systematize your business like you were going to franchise it, uh, you can be as involved as you want to be. But basically, you should be able to stand back and watch the system run. And uh, you should, you know, be and tweak it and make it better and find ways to improve it without having to be in it actually doing the technical tasks. Mm -hmm. There's a quote actually that just popped in my head. And it's basically like when you start anything, you start with the end in sight. And basically what that means is not just starting and and just winging it off the bat is you got to have a plan of how you want to not exit, but how you want the ideal lifestyle that you wanted when you bought the business to be and from the start. So you can start creating those systems. That's something I'm going through right now in my business that I obviously went the other route and and winged it. But, um, and then you kind of uh, have more time, like you said, to work on the business rather than in the business. Mm -hmm. I've heard that quote a ton of times or a lot of like, you know, entrepreneurs who, who know what they're doing. So they all talk about that and they, aren't in the office, you know, they're not even getting calls about their business. Like you see Elon Musk, for example, like he's able to go do what he has to do, go on these like interviews, you know, be a little bit more creative because he doesn't have to deal with like the people management as much. Cause now he has people that manage yeah. those people. Absolutely. Right? Um, I got, t- I got a quick story that mm-hmm. is, um, it's, it's, uh, valuable for all business and to, to be thinking along these lines. Um, when I was 18, I was a, a promoted to McDonald's management at a, at a large corporate store in, um, in, in Coquitlam. It was the second busiest McDonald's in the Vancouver Lower Mainland. Mm-hmm. And, um, and when we were busy, like we had hundreds of people in the store and it was lined up out the door. And, um, and I'm 18 and I'm, I'm management, which is a, a little bizarre. Um, and the, uh, on one of the busiest days that I can remember, uh, one of the more senior managers uh, took me off. I was helping. I was like trying to help keep things moving. We had um, probably 150 people in our lobby, uh, 10 people deep lined up on each till, 10 tills running. It was crazy. And the, um, the manager stopped me from helping to fill an order for one customer. And he asked me to come out and stand out in the lobby. So we like elbowed through people and went and stood back where, you know, they had the condiment dispensers and stuff like that. And he said, it's okay, this is what you do when it's like this. He goes, I want you to watch. And so we watched the front and he says, I want you to see where's, where's the backup? Where's it, where's it slowing down? So, uh, I said, well, 
there's a lot of people piled up around that drink machine. Well, why? Why aren't they at that drink machine? Oh, that one's out of ice. Okay, let's get that one refilled with ice. Don't do it. Tell somebody else to do it. Tell somebody to fill up that container with ice, and let's see what happens. So we, you did that. Within about 30 seconds, it had ice back where it needed to go, and the, the, the people dispersed and started using both drink machines. And then he says, okay, what's the next slow down what's the next weakest link and so we just sat there for like an hour picking the weakest link fixing the weakest link and and delegating one task to somebody to deal with that link and uh, within an hour we had that place running like clockwork the lineups were removed we're still that busy but just there wasn't bottlenecks because as a manager we're standing back watching the system run and uh, now that i'm working on systems in my business i have that goal in mind that I want to be able to watch my business from that level and tweak things and manage things rather than um, being involved in trying to answer another email or, or fill out another form or do something like that. I want to be able to stand back and work on the whole system. I've never heard somebody explain it in that way. And now that picture will be ingrained in my brain for the rest of my life. Perfect. So th- thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I could just, just you hear, hearing you explain that, I, I thought about like even like a Sims video game. Like you're not in the game playing the game. You're over here like moving people around, letting them, you know, operate any of those, you know, games where like the roller coaster tycoon, they all do that where it's like, okay, well, how do you manage the, the volume that's coming into this park and all that? I don't know. That's why that's where my brain went. Super (laughs) simple, you know, but uh, that's awesome. That's and how would you say like, okay, so was was you said you were in Abbotsford before in Langley. Do you think um, anything was different in the you know business sense in Langley? Anything that kind of stood out to you or is it pretty much the same? Well, I had so the business that I had in Langley um, was sort of taking on a life of its own. Somebody approached me at one point and asked me. Uh, if they could buy it because they really wanted to get into that web service type of work. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to uh, not be dealing with, you know, 200, 300 clients at a time. I wanted to have, uh, you know, do some more contract work with the the technical skills that I was developing. So I had a job in um, Vancouver. I sold a business in Abbotsford and I had an opportunity to buy. Uh, The, the, what I qualified for wouldn't get me a cardboard box on Granville street, but uh, to get as close to the Vancouver as I possibly could, I ended up getting a really sweet deal on a townhouse in Walnut Grove. And so that was when I, I entered the, the real estate market. And uh, the um, uh, and I fell in love with Langley. The people here, uh, it's it's more of a, at least in, you know when I started with Walnut Grove, it was, a, it was a, like a bedroom dr- district. It's got some of that country vibe, but it's also got some of the city vibe. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got people who work in the city. It's got people who work here locally. Uh, and so the, uh, and I, I love the energy of Vancouver. I also really like the peace and calm of the, of the country. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Langley has like the best of both worlds kind of blended together. Um, Abbotsford's a little m- more, uh, two country, I would say, I uh, love Abbotsford, no problem, but I, I love Langley. Mm-hmm. So then you think like a, a business like yours in Abbotsford, would it, you think you'd have the same challenges or be a little bit tougher there or easier? Um, I don't know. I think every I think every um, business environment has its own unique challenges. Uh, I think this business could be successful uh, in in pretty much any um, area that has a, a. I mean, half of our business is serving real estate um, agents, and uh, because of the blended services that we offer between print and signs, so the um, any place that has a, a, a budding real estate market would would benefit from an ultra digital printing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't know that actually. And it, 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 would you say then because it's a real estate driven, not driven, but you know, majority, like you said, is real estate services that you're providing. You'd probably expect that the real estate community be a little bit more progressive and also the city, because I find that, you know, you could be offering a certain service for a certain niche, but if the people, if the professionals in that, in that area aren't ready to adapt they might not be too eager to, to climb on the ship. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, uh, people have a tendency to do what they know uh, and to, to do what they're comfortable with. And, um, you know, a, a lot of that just comes down to, to s- their own personal psyche. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure why people do what they do, but I'm glad that we offer what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to get into the breakdown of, like, how you market yourself in Langley. I want to touch on that for sure. But first, I want to ask you a few Langley-related questions, okay. uh, just to knock those off. Um, so, 
you've been here. You said you love Langley. You love Walnut Grove. I, Walnut Grove is a great area. I love that they've actually pushed back a lot on developing those those certain uh, neighborhoods because yeah. I know how it has gotten in areas like Willoughby. Right. Obviously, they didn't have those subdividable homes or lots before. Um, and in Walnut Grove has like 5,000 square foot lots. So it gives you enough space in between homes where you're not totally compact and seeing your neighbor next door. Yeah. Um, but I noticed they're not they're not taking on much new development. So it's good. You kind of you get that, like you said, that country feel. And then you just hop over that bridge on uh, 208. Then you're in Willoughby, which is the complete opposite. <laughs> well, actually, I sold the townhouse in in uh, Walnut Grove and I bought a single detached house on the very north end of, Wal- uh, of Willoughby. Oh, yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I'm smack dab in the center of all of that development. Driving down 208 is a disaster at the moment. How do you, how do you like it there in comparison to Walnut Grove? Would uh, you go back? So the street that I'm on is pretty much uh, protected from kind of development. I back onto a uh, sort of one of those reservoir ponds. It's like a big duck pond. Uh, so I've got that sort of private space behind mm-hmm. um, and the uh, the lot that I'm in right now. So so the, the street that I'm on feels a lot like Walnut Grove in terms of how calm and peaceful it is. It's just as soon as you get out and drive one block and turn a corner, you're like right in the middle of townhouses and, and development and construction and the 208 disaster of the four lanes turns into two lanes, turns mm-hmm. into three lanes, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I can't wait for them to fix that. I'm actually planning on having... Um, I have a friend who I went to high school with who's on the council, so I want to have him on. We're going to talk about that yeah. street. And also, uh, this is a, a, sh- you know, a request, putting it out there, Eric yeah. Woodward. You know, I have somebody that is very familiar with him who might be able to help me get him on, but you know, it'd be cool to hear what he has going on behind the scenes now to address this issue because I know that was one of the key uh, components of like his, his, his yeah. you know, campaign. I did but all of his printing and science. Oh, awesome. So <laughs> <laughs> that must have been super uh, like a uh, heavy load because uh, like mu- he had the most signs out, I think, out of his whole group. Yeah, there was a lot. We did two and a half pallets of uh, Coroplast, um, which is the the four by eight sheets of plastic that you get used for that. Mm-hmm. We went, yeah, we went through, that's uh, 550 550 sheets of that uh, just for the provincial or for the uh, municipal election. Um, not just for Eric. Like not just for Eric. Like that's for uh, the whole thing. But uh, uh, I, I'd say more than 50% of that was his. In w- would you say like you guys were the go-to then for printing when it came to the election? Uh, I did all of his signs. Uh, I did a number of other ones. I didn't do the, um, uh, there was another coalition that I didn't, I didn't get any of their business. So there's other people. There's other. There's a. There's a decent number of print. Uh, there's a decent number of sign shops around. Mm-hmm. There's a decent number of print shops around. There's not a lot of print and sign shops around. Mm-hmm. So I did all his signs. We also did all of his uh, addressed and unaddressed ad mail. Oh, uh, wow. So we hit every home in Willoughby or in the in the uh, township of Langley three times in his uh, th- during his <laughs> his campaign so that's crazy and there's a strategy again we're going to touch on that yeah uh, because this is uh the best information if you're starting a business that you really should consider because print is in my opinion underrated if you if you know how to use it like yes. a lot of people think printing it print like uh, mail outs are dead but realis- realistically people have just too high expectations for mail outs they think it's like a, oh here you go once and it converts that's not the case nope. and we'll talk about that so you're talking about big making signs for you know the the, the campaigns and all that. Do you say because I'm I'm here trying to make sure that you know we advertise some events. So would you say there's a lot of events that you make these signs for uh, around Langley? Uh, there's a decent number of events. Uh, most of the clients that I have are um, routine regular sign buyers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a few events that I work with. Um, the uh, uh, the Twins Cancer Fundraising. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do signs for. There's the. Uh, uh, Langley, the Fort Langley Jazz Festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do a lot of printing and signs for, um, and so yeah, we definitely do a lot for mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the that one's the Cloverdale one, right? The the Twins Cancer Fundraising that's hosted in um, in uh, Cloverdale, yeah, and oh. then the uh, Fort Langley Jazz Festival is obviously in Fort mm-hmm. Langley. Mm-hmm. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I, 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 that one's a pretty big one. The Cloverdale. Yeah, it's one. huge. I mean. Uh, we need something like that <laughs> <laughs> because they have all the cool events over there. Um, not uh, not saying you should move to Cloverdale. You should definitely consider Langley, but you know Cloverdale's around the corner. So right. technically, it's convenient. I think I think people in Cloverdale, uh, because I, I grew up in that area too. A lot of people in Cloverdale consider themselves part of Langley. <laughs> Let's be honest, <laughs> instead of Surrey. So yeah. that's funny. Um, so 
we we have some food here. We're going to talk about that, but uh, let's go over some restaurants that you like in the area. Any that you work with, obviously, that you'll probably throw a shout out to, or or any that you prefer. Uh, so I I grew up. My first four years of life were spent traveling all over Southeast Asia, and I have a taste for uh, spicy and and uh, Oriental and um, uh, ethnic foods. And uh, so I have a really diverse flavor palette, and I love to explore everything. I also have three children that are diagnosed on the autistic spectrum, and so we go primarily to places that have chicken tenders and fries. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and when he, and he plays, so everywhere. Every, yeah, well, <laughs> not everybody has chicken tenders and fries, and it has to have the right texture, and it can't be too wet of a meat, and it can't be too dry of a meat, and it has to have just the right amount of stuff. Uh, dealing with kids with autism and preferences like that is, it can be a challenge. Um, so uh, we often end up at places like White Spot or, you know, things like that. When I get the opportunity to go out uh, on a date or something like that with my wife, it'll be um, at uh, the keg or, uh, you know, Earl's or uh, places like that. Um, Haven um, uh, uh, restaurant down in um, on 64th in Langley is good. Uh, they're fantastic, actually. Um, so I'm hoping to have uh, the brothers or somebody like that, like who's involved on here so we can do some food reviews for that because that's, yeah. I know, also, you know, they're, they're more the local brand rather than the kegs always, you know, go to, you can't go wrong. Um, same thing with like Earl's and Cactus, right? But Haven's definitely doing it differently. Do yeah. you do any like print for them or anything like that? I do a lot of print for uh, Haven Kitchen. And um, then there's a handful of smaller restaurants around that we do uh, like menus, takeout menus. Um, I'm thinking, trying to think of like specifically Langley ones. I do um, I do a lot of printing for the Clayton. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, a pub, uh, but uh, that's in Cloverdale, uh, just, just in Cloverdale. Um, the, uh, but they have fantastic food. Um, I also do, uh, work for Mai's Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're in Walnut Grove. Uh, we do menus for Tacaholic. Mm, uh, okay. they're down in Langley, authentic Mexican, uh, tacos, which yeah. are, are a really favorite of mine. I do a lot of printing for Emilio Finetti's, uh, oh, okay. pizzeria. In fact, uh, we sponsor, we have a, a, a deal with them and we have a pizza Friday for our staff every oh. Friday with Emilio's, uh, pizza. Mm -hmm. Uh, so. Yeah, I heard a good good things about Emilio's. We had Paradiso on, which is around yeah. the corner from my office. I was trying to tell him, hey, Ultra Digital, you know, <laughs> you're doing print. You should talk to Ultra Digital. Right. Um, but yeah, Emilio's, you know, close runner up um, for Paradiso, in my opinion. They have also like a gourmet style pizza. It's not just like a plain pizza. No, no, they got really interesting ingredients. Yeah, yeah, they stand out for sure. Um, so I'm just, you know, we went over pretty much your business, you know, why you ended up there, how it's going for you in Langley in comparison to other cities. I picked Langley because of my, uh, because of the housing, because I could afford a, a house here. And at that point I was working in Vancouver. Uh, then I had the opportunity to work with a company that was in Langley. Then I had the opportunity uh, because of proximity mm -hmm. uh, to buy a business from somebody who lived just up the street from me. Oh, and okay. uh, so, um, and it was a business in Langley. So that was all really convenient. Mm -hmm. So now. that's how you heard about the business? Just Yeah. Wow. So, so, I, so I knew the previous owner of Ultra Digital. Uh, he lived up the street from me. Our kids played together, uh, you know, and, and we were hanging out and, and talking one day and, and uh, he was talking about trying to sell his business. And I had this, uh, you know, middle of the night, brilliant idea <laughs> that uh, I should get back in the driver's seat and own a business again. So uh, I jumped in and, and made an offer and, and we slammed together a deal really quickly and I bought the business. So like yeah. it, that... I was always curious because you ended up there. I, like one of the questions that I had was, you know, why you ended up there. You had a background. You said your, your parents yeah. earlier on, you said your parents, you know, had a print shop. They worked for a print shop. So you had that familiarity with that. Mm -hmm. And then the opportunity came around and you're just like, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, at that, I was working with another business um, and I was helping them to grow their business. And we had doubled or tripled the size of the business over uh, five years. Um, and my, I was helping the other, that owner to make more money, but my salary was, you know, flat. And, you know, you start hearing that voice in the back of your head that, you know, nobody ever got rich working for somebody else. And so if I wanted to like, you know, make the next step in my career, I probably needed to get back in the driver's seat and own something. So I, while I was hungry to do something like that, I was, uh, I ran into this guy and he, he was talking about selling and I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure I could do print and science mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, how hard could it be? Mm -hmm. Right. So, and did you have like experience with uh, like, you, you did have experience with printing, but what about with like the mail out pro the, the, yeah, the no, nothing, the guide you, that just, you came about just because of yeah. your, okay. I, you know, uh, it's, um, 
Richard Brunson said, you know, uh, from Virgin says, uh, and, and it's been one of those things that I've just lived by is say yes and then figure it out, you know. So uh, if you have the opportunity to do something, at least that, you know, I, I'm good at that. I'm good at figuring things out. Uh, I used to think anybody could, but I guess not everybody can. But some people can just jump in and figure out how things work and why things work the way that they do and whatever. And I'm pretty quick on figuring that out. So I jumped in and I knew a little bit about print. I didn't really know anything about, you know, paper and paper weights and, and uh, press sheet sizes and, and that they, they actually have a long grain and a short grain and you need to know what is important for what so that you buy the right stuff. And I didn't know anything about different types of vinyl and what you use on a car versus what you use on a sign versus what you put up on the side of a building and you make stickers (laughs) like that. You know, I I didn't know anything. I just jumped in and I I started buying from the same suppliers that the previous owner bought for and from and and through course of uh, trial and error and a few really costly mistakes and a few signs that I had to make and then redo and things like that, I kind of learned uh what the parameters are what i need and why and where and and uh so i i just taught myself really quick (laughs) yeah well i mean but you didn't stop there because anybody could have stopped there anybody could have figured out the business figured out enough to let it you know run and and, you know manage it from afar Mm -hmm. and like focus on other aspects of the business but you went ahead and you created this guide right that that Okay, I'm not going to ruin the story, so you tell the story about how you came about with okay. this marketing guide. So I, uh, so I wrote, I wrote this guide called the, the John's Guide to Farm Marketing, which uh, anybody that wants to can stop by my shop and pick one up. Um, or uh, email me at jon at udp.fm, and I will email one to you. I'd uh, be happy for you to read it. Um, basically... Uh, I jumped in and I started supporting all of these, uh, you know, realtors and other businesses that were uh, marketing in different ways. And I can see the budgets that they're spending. And uh, to some degree, I can see what kind of numbers they're pulling in, how many homes that they're selling, how many listings they're getting. And I just paid attention. I paid attention to who was doing what and um, how successful they were being, how those businesses were growing or, or not. Uh, and, and I learned a few things based on who was being the most successful and who was to some degree being the least successful. And, um, I, I believe in farm marketing. I, uh, it was one of those things that was taught to me many years ago in a sales career to treat, to treat sales like a farm. Um, you know, there's a law of the farm. If you plant seed, you're going to reap something. And, uh, you know, a lot of people at, at that point, especially young salespeople, uh, they will go in and uh, they'll try something. They'll try a script and they'll cold call people and they'll use this script and they don't get good results. So after, you know, they're getting no, no, no all the time. And so they, so they think to themselves, okay, this script sucks. I'm going to do something else. And uh, so they write a new script and then they, they try that for a while and, and it doesn't pay off. Okay, this script sucks. I'm going to try something else. Maybe I'm going to start going door to door. And so they just keep trying new things. And what ends up happening is uh, if you look at it from a farm perspective, it's like going out and planting seed in, in one field. And uh, before you see anything sprouting, you leave it and you go to another field and you plant seed. And before you see anything sprouting, you leave that and go to the next one. Well, at some point, seed is going to sprout. And as a salesperson, there's something that happens when you get committed to the end result that uh, if I'm planting seed, I'm going to get a sale. It doesn't matter how bad of a salesperson you are. If you walk up to somebody on the sidewalk and you say, you don't want to buy anything from me today, do you? like, you know, all down and dejected. And, you know, it's like the worst possible sales uh, tactic to connect with somebody. Uh, Most people are going to say no. But somebody at some point is going to stop and say, I don't know, what are you selling? And one of those people is eventually going to say, actually, I need one of those right now. So it's it's a game of numbers. But the reality is, is that if you commit to the end result, then at some point you're going to get a result. And then you can see, you can learn from that result and then you can go and plant a new field. But, but when you get committed to staying and doing exactly what you're doing and you're going to get results, something changes. Something changes in your results. Something changes in your career. There's something about that commitment to make it happen. So, uh, so treat your sales, treat sales in general. It doesn't matter what kind of business it is, like it's a farm. And whatever it is that you're going to try, do it consistently and know that you're going to get something from it. And don't stop until you get some harvest and then you can learn from that harvest and tweak, adjust, get better percentages, get a better way of presenting to people or whatever. But stay on one thing until you get the results from that. So in I've watched that the most successful businesses and realtors uh, through ultra-digital printing 
follow this rule of the farm and they 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 actually even call it in real estate farm marketing mm-hmm. um but it's not just a real estate thing it can happen for any business anybody with a, a demographic that they can define whether that be um uh you know an age or, or age range or or you know whatever the demographics are or if it's a, a geographic area where they can say okay these are the addresses that i'm going after um and you consistently market to that area then you're going to get like really good uh results um and uh i so watching the people that that were successful uh and how they spent their money and where they sent their advertising and and whatnot i came up with a some parameter i I studied it and i figured out what was going on and i actually wrote a little guide that explains sort of the logic and the science behind Mm -hmm. why this works and if if i were starting a brand new business today and it was serving a community that i could define that was right around me i i would absolutely stick with print marketing Mm-hmm. Even though I'm a web guy and I can program and, and, and I can do all kinds of technical things, I would absolutely do that, the, the print marketing as well. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's to, to touch on your point, like you need to stick with it. I also think it's something that is there to supplement what you're already doing. Like if you're going out and you're, let's do uh, not real estate because we always talk about real estate. <laughs> let's talk about a restaurant. Okay, let's talk about pizza places because mm-hmm. we've already had a pizza place on here and you're talking about the geographic farming. I asked them one of the questions was how often do you touch these people? Not uh, <laughs> like with marketing. Um, <laughs> they, uh, um, he said six months. Every six months he sends out a menu. I'm just like, mm-hmm. wow, you get results from that? He's like, yeah, I get calls. And, and then I, I'm asking him and I'm, I'm trying to explain to him, like if you were to send that, you know, twice, twice a month, like that'd be a huge shift in the amount of you're spending, but narrow down that focus instead of sending it out to like 10,000 people, you send it to a thousand people. And in, in six months you're doing, you know, you're doing uh, biweekly, right? right? So, so you're narrowing down that focus. And then once you see results there, then is when you start to spread up, uh, you know, the geographic Grow area. Your farm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, but there's also so many aspects to it. So like this, uh, goes hand in hand with like if if you have a storefront or if you're running events. Uh, I guess for real estate, it's easy. You do an open house in that area. You're gonna also be doing mm-hmm. farming in that area. You're also going to be door knocking in that area, right? So all businesses, though, would you say they could use the exact same model? Uh, not all businesses. Some people sell things that are um, you know one or two customers in every geographic, and they're all over the world or whatever. So um, you know uh, there's a lot of online services and businesses. But if but if it's a business that serves a community, a restaurant, a local shop. Um, a local service, local plumbing and, and um, you know, electrical contractors, uh, those sort of things, um, they absolutely c- would benefit from, from this. The, the psychology, um, one of the key aspects and one thing that's really important is that the branding is clear and, and um, recognizable uh, because the psychology of what this farm marketing is, is um, it goes back to a prehistoric part of our brain where uh, we don't trust what's new. We don't trust what is unfamiliar. We don't trust what we haven't um, established as being um, a regular part of our environment. So if you go out there and you send one flyer uh, once in a while, like, you know, to a, to a neighborhood, uh, they go and they check their mailbox and it's junk mail. Okay, so we know that people are gonna look at junk mail for about a second or less. And so as they flick through their junk mail, uh, they have to d- decide, is this junk or is this something that I need to keep? And they make that decision in about a second. And in that second, they're not reading your content. They're not looking at what house you just sold or what your pizza menu is. They see your logo. They see what the coloring of the branding is and, and, and how it's displayed. And their brain either registers, I recognize this as something that is familiar and normal to me, or their brain is going to say, this is new. I don't trust it. And so they, you know, it goes in the pile. So then another week or two weeks go by and they get their junk, they get their mail and they're flicking through, looking for bills, looking for checks, looking for whatever. And they find your branding again and they see it again. And now there's something in the brain that says, I recognize this. Uh, It's not necessarily trusted, but it's not brand new. The third meaningful, we call that a meaningful impression. The third meaningful impression uh, is what does the magic. There's something in our brain that goes, I recognize this, I see this all the time, I trust this, and so I can, I can accept it as being part of my environment. So, you know, whether you're talking about a pizza place, there's a lot of brands and a lot of people competing for advertising space. And so somebody sits down on a Friday night and they're like, I wanna have pizza to watch the game and, and where am I gonna go? Um, they're gonna go, 
if they have if they have three pizza menus sitting in front of them, they're going to go to the one that they've seen the branding the most often for, mm-hmm. and it they can't even explain to you why. They Did just you trust. Say there's like a time frame that you need to send this to. Obviously, that might be in there, but like you can't just send one once or twice a year. You need to send it how consistently before it becomes. Or could you even go and, and be annoying with it? You know what I mean? Like if you send it too often, they might be not to it. Or I think every business is going to have its its own, um, you know, uh, different parameters for what that is. Uh, I think once there there absolutely is, in terms of the psychology, there absolutely is a uh, uh, an effect of seeing it regularly and seeing it, um, when I say regularly, I mean like multiple times in a month. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're seeing, if you're sending something, but maybe once a month, I think would probably be the minimum. Mm-hmm. Uh, beyond that, your brain begins to say, okay, well, this is, this is not something that I see all the time. This is something I only see once in a while. So the uh, so that trust factor comes with seeing the branding consistently, regularly, enough that you remember the last time you saw it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the key. When was the last time I saw this? So that your brain can make that connection and, and, and establish that trust level. So if you're uh, if you're sending out and it if you're sending out uh, a, a menu, but you also have a bus bench advertisement or you have a billboard somewhere or something, so they're seeing your advertising or they're seeing that exact same branding uh, that's on the flyer is also on that sign, uh, then their brain will connect those things and they, they begin to say, I really trust and I recognize these things. So, so a lot of people, some people will make um, their decision because you know they've been to these three restaurants and I picked this one because their pepperoni tastes better than somebody else's. But if, they've, if they don't really have a preference or they don't have some way of quantifying why they want to go to one restaurant or the other, they're almost always going to pick the one that they've seen the branding the most often for. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, even though it's not necessarily any better. Right. Yeah. Don't you don't know, know any better. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. I know the color thing. That's something that uh, is super important because like you said, it's like the first thing people see the branding, the logo. Yeah. Like as long as it's clear, right. Yeah. You could probably, you know, get a good understanding of what it's about. Right. You kind of want to uh, re- want it to resemble your business in a way or can it just be any branding? Because so. Any branding, as long as it's consistent, will give you the trust factor, but they don't know what they're trusting. They're just saying, I've seen this guy all the mm-hmm. time. Um, if if the if I can look at your branding and within a second tell what you do, then you're going to have a, a more effective uh, result from that. Mm-hmm. So if your branding includes the fact that you're a pizza place, pizza is a pretty easy to see word. A realtor is a pretty easy to see word uh, that you're going to register as you flick through that mail. Uh, that'll be effective. Mm-hmm. I guess last question on the subject is basically since you're saying it works so well for, you know, top agents uh, and li- and specifically like, I guess you can't really tell if it's, you know, Langley related or not. They could be in Surrey, but they're still using you. But so let's just open it up, right? Mm-hmm. It could be from anywhere, but the agents that are using your marketing, would you say you see them um, scale that marketing often or do they kind of stay with, you know, the same orders or amounts or... Uh, the ones that are the most effective are sending out more than 5,000 pieces and they have a set farm uh, and they, they consistently send to that same, that same area. Uh, the, uh, and I think that that, that 5,000 mark, five to 7,000 is where you're getting so many referrals and so many leads uh, from that effective marketing that, that you don't really want to go much mm-hmm. bigger unless you're going to get a much bigger team. Um, the, uh, but I've seen a lot of people and I've talked to a lot of people that have started off with, you know, not doing farming. Uh, one thing that's quite common is, uh, and this is specifically to, to, for realtors, but one thing that's quite common is somebody will get a listing in a neighborhood. So they will, uh, send a just listed postcard with all kinds of great details about that property, uh, to the neighborhood where they just got the listing once. And, um, and they don't, uh, <laughs> I've done that. and then, Too uh, you know, times. and, and sometimes, I mean, you can get results from it, but it's really hit and miss and it's not going to be a predictable amount. Uh, and so what I would suggest when I, when I'm talking to a realtor who's saying doing that, I will uh, say, Hey, listen, pick an area that you want to drive to every day. And so you might get a listing in Chilliwack, but take your branding on your postcard and write a just listed uh, don't say in your neighborhood, just listed and put the Chilliwack thing in there and send it to your mm, farm area. Okay. And, and it, it doesn't matter because mm. what's somebody, 
98% of the people are flicking through that going, oh, another realtor, don't care. Um, but that meaningful impression still hits in the back mm -hmm. of their mind. Mm -hmm. And so after some period of time, somebody's going to eventually say, it doesn't matter that you've had a Chilliwack listing and you've had a Surrey listing, and maybe you've got a vacation property up in the interior. Like, it doesn't matter. You just keep farming and keep pushing into that uh, one geographic area that you want to drive to every day. And somebody's going to eventually say, oh, I need to sell my house. I need a realtor. And they're going to look at a handful of realtors that are uh, that they've already, you know, uh, you know, that they're just going to randomly pick, but they think yeah. they're randomly picking, but they're not. Mm -hmm. The person that they've seen the branding for the most often is the most likely the person that they're going to call first. Mm -hmm. And because you've been sending your stuff to that one geographic area, you have a very high chance of being that person. And so once you've got that and you start getting listings from that geographic area that you're farming, now we can do just listed in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. just sold in your neighborhood, just, you know, whatever. And, and, uh, that, the one, and once you start getting leads from that area, then you can start to grow that, um, and you know, yeah, do the next exponentially, do the next postal code over, do the next postal code over, but be really consistent. Always send everything to that area. Mm -hmm. One last thing I'm going to say about print, and you're talking about consistency, and that's going to up your printing costs, which it does a little bit. But print is interesting because the actual individual copies are really, really cheap. When you pay for printing, you're paying for the full for the setup. You're paying for the plates and the paper and everything and the and and color checking and all the stuff that happens before we print off that first piece of paper. Mm -hmm. But then if I run ten thousand or even a hundred thousand of your whatever your printed material is, um, the cost does not go up one for one. It 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 you're amortizing that setup and cleanup cost over the entire run. Mm -hmm. So it costs way less to run per piece. It costs way less to run a hundred thousand of something than it does to run 1,000. So if you pre-print, say, 100,000 postcards and you have all of your color elements and everything all that in, included in that postcard and then you do a, a coupon on the back as a black and white impression as you print, you can bring your costs down 50, 60 percent by having those pre-printed shells and then just using them as you need them. And um, you can then afford to be a lot more consistent without really raising your costs that high. Wow, yeah, that's uh, didn't even think about that because obviously that's the first thing people think about is like, oh, I'm forking up like thousand bucks for for something that doesn't pan out, and then but like you're saying is if they do it consistently, what like the first rounds maybe a thousand, after that it's like two thousand for for another like double the same amount or yeah. more than double, right? So that's that's cool, and I'm glad you came in to share that because you know that's super important not just with real estate but also with lots of businesses, and um, you're in Langley, so. All these businesses, business owners and potential business owners coming here, moving here, already operating here. Your guy, Ultra Digital Printing, can handle all that for you. Um, one last thing before we go. Obviously, we are on this live, in, live from Langley, BC podcast. We like to promote local businesses and restaurants, and I like to do a food review at the end of every episode because it's lunchtime. Yep. And I dragged you out here during your prime lunchtime hours. Um, we wanted to, you know, have some tacos because, like you said, you like Tacoholics. We'll have that one day with Tacoholics, but I went to Taco Factory because they're open a little bit earlier, and uh, they have the tacos here. So let's dig into this. Um, obviously, we're not food experts. We don't claim to be, but uh, we just want to, you know, share what's in Langley because people here, they want to know that there's just not farms and... and <laughs> chicken coops that we get our food from you know because everyone just everyone just hears that langley you know you're in farm country but it's not like that at all no uh give me a second i'm gonna rip this quick okay wow these are big churros so these are the desserts okay with the chocolate oh fantastic okay we got some extra in there too um there's one set of tacos in here that is okay all right so i guess tacos are shareable this. I ordered, that's why they were so cheap. I looked at the menu and I'm like, oh, why is this only $30? <laughs> I, I tried to order one of everything. Um, so there would have been actually Oh, so nine. that's what you got. You've got three three different tacos. Yeah, yeah. Kay. So that's funny. Uh, I meant like one of everything. Like they come in three. So I was going to get yeah. the Al Pastor, which I, that's my favorite. You know, it's uh, like pork with yep. um, uh, pineapple. So it's always nice to have. I don't know if you like pineapple. I'm a pineapple and pizza guy. No. So, okay. See, I I love I love pineapple, but it does not belong on pizza. <laughs> okay, we're gonna <laughs> have to agree to disagree on that one because I know those discussions get super heated. <laughs> um, so here, grab one here. Um, I think there's a you know uh, there's a chicken one, 
with the, the red onion. There's uh, the carne asada, the, the traditional. So you're not going to like the al pastor then, the one with the pineapple, you said? No, no. I have pizza. I draw oh, the okay, line of okay. pizza. I like pineapple. Okay, I like so pineapple on almost everything. Make up your mind then. But I don't like it on pizza. <laughs> it makes the pizza wet. Depends. This is my issue. Put with it on though, because okay, we're not gonna get into this. It's already <laughs> getting close. To, we're gonna. It's gonna get heated. Um, so yeah, grab one there. There's the chicken, the carne, okay. and the pork. Is um, there? Is there napkins? Uh, no. There's not. There's okay. It. Okay. That's okay. So what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna let you have that, and I'm gonna take the bowl. Perfect. There we go. What's this sauce here? That looks like a just like a, a pico de gallo or a, yeah, it's like a red like kind a of mild sauce. spicy yeah. Homemade taco sauce of some sort. There you go. There's some of that for you. Oh, Thank wonderful. You so, much. so we're gonna dig into two today Kay. because we don't have all the options. Like I said, that one's the pollo uh, bibil. I don't know what that just has the the red mm. onion on it. And you put the taco sauce on there. I so did. Let me get into that. And that taco sauce is pretty good. Is it spicy? Um. Canadian spicy. Okay. Well, I am sensitive to that spice, even though I was born in South America. Where were you born? Peru. Peru. That's one of the only South American countries I've ever been to. Oh, really? Yeah. I went to Lima when I was 11. Oh, nice. I think we might have talked about that for some reason, because I think I knew that. Um, yeah, so we came here when I was six. My wife's like, you don't have, you, you're not Spanish because your taste buds aren't Spanish mm -hmm. because I eat something spicy and, and like it hurts in my mouth and my stomach and on the way out. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I can't handle spices. Indian food, same thing. Like, I don't know. I, I wish I could because I, I, it doesn't stop me from eating it, but I don't like it after. Okay. While you eat yours, I'm going to tell you a funny um, Lima story. Okay. So when okay. I was in Lima, uh, I went, I went to a, um, some sort of a, mini mart sort of thing and i bought an inca cola yellow inca cola delicious um and uh when i was leaving they said oh we'll give you a bag for that i said oh, okay so they took the inca cola and they dumped it into a plastic bag put a straw in it and gave it back and they kept they kept the bottle so they could return it for the refund i guess and um and i didn't get to keep the bag and now every time i ever go into a store or a liquor store or anything and they say oh would you like a bag for that i'm like no, <laughs> I want the handy bottle that it comes in. That's all. So I think of Lima all the time. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's um traditional, like the street vendors, they do that. Uh, Inga Cola, though, that's obviously growing up. And so we had a lot of, what was you, what does it taste like? Oh, um, it, oh, it tastes like L&P from New Zealand. Um, the <laughs> New Zealand has its own pop. Mm -hmm. beverage uh, called lemon and pyroa lmp um and it's also yellow and uh so it's kind of like uh, the same flavor though no it's not the same flavor so it's kind of like a um uh like a mountain dew meets a fruit juice that's carbonated how about this bubble gum depends on the bubble gum i guess i've heard from my wife, obviously, I grew up, I'm just like, this is Inca Cola taste. There's nothing yeah. that this <laughs> represents. This right. is straight from the Incas. <laughs> she has it. She's like, tastes like bubble gum. Like the, like the, like the bubble, not bubble gum. Oh, uh, oh. crush. The, the, not cream soda, the pink one. What's the, cr the pink, yeah. the pink cream crush. Soda. Is it cream soda? Yeah, that's cream soda. Okay, so not bubble right. gum, cream soda. So that's what she tasted right off mm -hmm. the bat. And I'm like, wow, you just ruined my childhood. <laughs> well, it's got a, but it's got a fruity... It's got a fruity sort of vibe to it, mm -hmm. but it, it's like a Mountain Dew with a fruity vibe. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so distinct, and it's yeah. my favorite. We always have it for you know dinner and stuff. Okay, we. so that taco was freaking delicious. That was good. You can't go and wrong taco. with tacos, to be honest. So this place is located in Walnut Grove. Um, we have dessert. So yeah. my favorite part okay. is uh, churros. Uh, these are basically Mexican donuts. Um, you can't eat them if you don't dip them in something, unless you're a psychopath, because... Like they're super dry, I'm not calling you anything. Do you eat them? Do you eat them without sauce? Uh, sometimes. Okay, never mind. Yeah. I take that back. That's okay. But this is this. I've is been called worse than psychopath. <laughs> I don't know how this is so like it's so it's it can be stiff and it's like these are long though. These are the longest churros I've ever seen actually. They are well, I mean, they kind of come out of an extrusion thing, so mm. they can be any length. But 
So in Peru, we have these. They're actually stuffed with things. So mm-hmm. you can get like a chocolate stuffed, like, mm-hmm. a, like a vanilla stuff, a condensed milk, strawberry. So you don't need to dip because it's actually stuffed it with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Really good. Yeah. yeah. Can't go wrong, like I said, with, with Mexican food. There's a ton of Mexican restaurants in Langley, lots to choose from. Taco Holics is usually my go to for the smaller uh, hand sized mm-hmm. tacos. They're super affordable, and it feels like you're in Mexico when you go in there. Yeah, absolutely. Second best, I would say, just just again, just because we have it here, and I think they have a, a lot more meat in comparison to like the full restaurants, uh, is is the Taco Factory, and then third, I would say Viva Mexico because they're downtown, you know, on the one oh way yeah. there. Yep. But yeah, that's more of a sit down spot. So yep. obviously, there's the charge for the sit down services, um, and and but again, great food there. The best menu there, huge menu, um, whereas you go to these other two taco shops, it's essentially just tacos, right? Yep. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you, you work there. You work for them. or They, they hire you. Definitely uh, check out Tacoholics. That's down. So it's on. It's where Logan turns into uh, 56 on that curve mm-hmm. uh, where, uh, <coughs> uh, where uh, let's see, what's it right across from? Just right down in the area across from, like, the parking lot where the Value Village is at is just on the back side of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, right at, almost at the beginning right of the one-way. Like uh, right at the end of the one-way. End way. of the one-way, yeah. Right at the end exactly. of the one-way. Yeah. yeah, if you go to the one-way, go to the end of the one-way and turn left on 56th, uh, you'll pass Talkaholics coming mm-hmm. out of there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great spot. Definitely check it out. And then, if you go that way into past, fi- past Talkaholics and you keep going, it turns into Logan Avenue, you'll pass Ultra Digital Printing. And that's why it's your favorite spot because you could probably <laughs> walk there. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Well, thanks again, John, for hopping on here. Um, thanks so much for watching. Again, this is live from Langley. I'm your host, Daniel. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, if you have any suggestions of other restaurants we can go check out, definitely drop that in the you know comments down below. And uh, yeah, give uh, Ultra Digital a follow. Get, where can they find you? So we're on um, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, Ultra Digital Printing, um, on both of those, and. Uh, the uh, and we have our website udp.fm, uh, just the five letters uh, and u for u to, u for ultra d for digital p for printing, dot fm, which stands for the Federation of Micronesia, uh, but it may gives us a nice short domain name. So that's hilarious. I didn't know that. <laughs> I bet you get a lot of mixed uh, messages on there. <laughs> Someone's calling you like, hey. I I have to explain it a lot, which seems like the short domain name is then hard, difficult because you have to explain it, but mm-hmm. then nobody ever forgets it. Mm-hmm. No, it's pretty straightforward yeah. in my opinion, but I obviously have no experience with the, you know, all that stuff. This is good. All right. Um, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. No, thanks for coming in. We'll, uh, we'll have to do it again. We'll uh, have to figure something out where we can collaborate with, you know, marketing and events because i want to throw some events in langley as well as i'm going to have a ton of uh event planners on here yeah so uh having them you know give you a call or other businesses give you a call that'd be great i, I hope i, I can love to pass help. on some business yeah fantastic awesome thank well, you thanks so much thanks so much for watching